Make your winning move today and bet at my bookie. Use promo code GATERS and claim your deposit match. Redeemable up to $1,000. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere with my bookie. Gators Breakdown. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. The Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC and at Gators Breakdown on social media as well. Coming at you right here on this Sunday. Hey, first time in a while. No game to review since the bye week, I guess. But here we are, a little bit of college football playoff reaction. And oh, man, some chaos on Saturday and chaos ensues on Sunday. FSU not in the final four, not in the college football playoff. We'll go through kind of a conference championship recap, how we got here, and Florida's impact on FSU missing the college football playoff. Had a question come in from a Gators Breakdown Plus member. So, hey, what better way to kind of talk about college football playoff reaction right here to put some Gator angle into it. But, hey, there, there's a little bit of an impact there, I, I, I'd say. Uh, and also, on Saturday, some recruiting news for the Gators. Gain a commitment again from Makai Burrow. And Kendall Jackson decommits from the Gators. So, man, defensive line has been a storyline <laughs> the last few weeks uh, for this Florida Gator 2024 recruiting class. So we'll recap Saturday what happens a bit there, but plenty to get into right here as we uh, – hey, we don't have a bowl game to talk about, unfortunately. <laughs> All these other, of course, uh, SEC um, opponents and, and fellow members uh, getting their bowl game announcements, but uh, unfortunately – uh, the only good news Florida gets today is that FSU and Georgia will not be playing for a national championship since they did not make the college football playoff. Uh, but uh, we will not be hearing uh, any ball talk for Florida uh, right here. So that's unfortunate, but we do have some stuff to talk about right here. So everybody hit that like button. Subscribe to Gators Breakdown if you haven't done so yet. But hey, some of you joining me live right here. I wasn't sure when I was going to be able to get to this episode here on this Sunday um, You know, with the season. In, not in swing in, anymore kind of opens up a bit the, the schedule so doing some more family things of course holidays coming up but all that uh thanks for joining me live right here on gators breakdown hit that like button right here thank you for joining me live subscribe to gators breakdown on youtube your favorite podcast platform and hey i tell you what the, uh, i'm going to give another shout out to gators breakdown plus just because a lot of new signups lately everybody thank you so much for that um kind of will Follow that with today's episode as well with a question coming in. You get extra episodes. You get access to that Discord where the conversation uh, is just fast and furious. If you want to talk some Gator football with some other Gator fans out there, uh, you know, uh, not in the message board format, but in kind of a chat format, you can do it. You get access to the Discord by being the Gators Breakdown Plus member. You get ad-free episodes of Gators Breakdown. Uh, newsletter, Q&As, all that good stuff. Link is in the description to join Gators Breakdown Plus. Plus. All right, let's get to it. College football playoff reaction. No surprise who the top two were going to be. Michigan, number one. Washington, number two. Then Texas beats Oklahoma State on Saturday. So we kind of knew who the three of the teams were going to be. There was not much drama with the way the conference championship games played out. We needed to wait to see. Of course, Michigan wasn't going to lose to Iowa, but go back to Friday night and Washington beating Oregon in, in a great game there. I was so excited to, to, to be able to watch that game. Oregon's only two losses of the season coming to Washington. Uh, I personally would have had Washington the number one over Michigan just because the, of their schedule. I, I thought highly of the Pac-12 this year. No issue, Michigan being number one, splitting hairs there. I personally just would have had Washington number one. Uh, but here we got Michigan, Washington, Texas, and then, of course, we get to Saturday, we're all watching the SEC championship game, and what that would, if Alabama beat Georgia, that was going to have make, make chaos happen. We, we kind of knew if that happened, you'd have to start considering Alabama. You'd have to consider Georgia still. Then it wouldn't make it hard for Florida State. As, as, or it wouldn't make it as easy for Florida State. We didn't know how it would play out. They still needed to play their game, but little did we know they were going to be on their third-string quarterback playing in the ACC championship game versus Louisville. They win. And then we get to Sunday and how it's going to work out. Who's going to be the fourth team in there? Is it going to be what we mostly thought? Georgia on the outside looking in, but between Alabama and Florida State. And then so Sunday morning, of course, a little bit. I didn't have a unique thought here, uh, but I gave my top four. It was Washington. It was Michigan. It was Texas. And I went Bama. If they're going to give us the best games, I went Alabama. 
I had no issue. If Florida State would have been number four, Bama was named the number four team. I think the committee got it right in some ways, got it wrong in some ways. But the way I would have leaned, the way I would have went, would be to put Bama at number four. If they're going to give us the best games, which is what I think they should do, they got the, I think they got the four right. But I would, have had no, I would have had no issue with Florida State being the fourth team. I think at some point you have to mix best, best teams you think right now with resume, and at the same time, with that first part, the best teams right now, unfortunately, injuries go play a part in that. Right now, without Jordan Travis, it's no doubt Florida State's not one of the four best teams. Now, should they get to prove they're not one of the four best teams? Possibly. And maybe they did in some ways the last two weeks. Struggling versus Florida. Struggling versus Louisville with backup quarterbacks. I think the writing on the wall there is you're not going to probably win a game in the, in the final four. You get to the semifinal, more than likely you get beat. But should they deserve that chance to maybe show it? In some ways, yes. In some ways, yes. But you got to pick four teams. I'd go with four best right now. Florida State's not one of those best four. So that's the way, that, that's the way I saw it. But how did we get here? How did we get to this point? And I had Gators Breakdown Plus member, new Gators Breakdown Plus member, Dennis. He joined Gators Breakdown Plus today, sent me a question today. It's a big, big thanks for him here, but brought up some good points. And I was, I was thinking about how to go from a Florida angle here. We're a Florida podcast. We're a Gators Breakdown. Of course, we usually talk college football playoff anyway. It's just, we're also a college football podcast. <laughs> Florida's in college football. We're going to talk college football playoff. But Dennis brings in a really good question. The Florida State-Florida game may have had a big impact on Florida State being left out. That's the first part. And he's right. I Absolutely, in a couple of ways. The first way is, not good news for Florida, is Florida hurt Florida State's strength of schedule. The ACC, if you look at up and down Florida State's schedule, now don't get me wrong, they should get a lot of credit for beating LSU at the beginning of the year, but that was with Jordan Travis, of course. They had some close calls, Boston College, throughout the season, Miami, Florida, but we go here to Florida. You know, Florida being five and seven, FSU contributed to that, of course. Uh, but Florida floundering with bowl eligibility toward the late half of the season, that hurt Florida State. You know, the ACC wasn't the strongest. And forget me with that whole, the ACC had a better record versus the SEC. Okay. Matchup one versus one, two versus two, three versus three, four versus four for both conferences. It ain't going to turn out that way. Credit for LSU. I mean, I mean, FSU. They beat LSU. They beat Florida, but that's kind of the point. They beat a bad Florida team. They needed Florida to be a pretty good team. They needed to up the resume because the ACC was not that strong this year. Was not that strong this year. They needed Florida to bump up their strength of schedule. And if Florida would have been a better team, if Florida would have been a, say, eight-win team, Florida State may sneak into the playoff anyway. But you know, bad news for Florida in some ways that, okay, well, in a, in a lot of ways, not good enough to make a bowl game. Well, that stinks for us, too. But in the end, that hurts Florida State. But then let's go to the game itself and the way the game played out. Late in the game, Tate Rodermaker scrambles. Jaden Hill, you won't ever sell me. It was malicious, but bang, bang, right at the first down sticks. Somebody's got to make a play. Jaden Hill goes for a low tackle, hits Rodermaker, rightfully called targeting. Don't get me wrong. I just don't think it was malicious at all. So Tate Rodermaker out, looks to be concussed at that moment, comes back in and plays for Florida State, by the way, then can't play in the ACC championship game. That hit could also impact Florida State's chances. Say Tate Rodermaker is able to play versus Louisville. And say Florida State goes on to win that game 30-10 to 10 with Tate Rodemaker. That in and of itself may be enough for the committee to say, all right, well, maybe Florida State's offense is good enough. You know, Florida State had to play Brock Glenn, third-string quarterback versus Louisville. You could tell he was a true freshman. You could tell he was third-string. You could tell that the offense was still struggling. Two weeks in a row that the offense was, was struggling. But with Rodermaker, if he was able to play in the ACC championship game and prove, now I ain't even saying he'll do this, but the opportunity, say, say it would have played out that way. Say he didn't get concussed versus Florida, or say he's 
her healthy enough to play even after that hit. If he goes and has a really good game versus Louisville, and then I think the committee could have said, all right, well, offense is still pretty good, not as good, but good enough where we think they, they still deserve a chance. So by Florida, Hill knocking out Rodemaker, that lingering into the week later, I think that also had an effect on Florida State's chances. Because Brock Glenn wasn't going to do much versus Louisville. He just wasn't. And I'm not sure Rodemaker would have been anyway, but at least the, the point was he'll be healthy enough for the playoff run. If Florida State could get into the playoffs, Rodemaker would be the quarterback. So if he was able to play versus Louisville and play really good, that might have been enough for the committee to put Florida State in anyway. So there's your impact from the Florida angle. First of all, unfortunately for us, not being good enough, and then knocking Rodemaker out to where Florida State's offense looked bad again versus Louisville. They won the games. They found a way to win. Great defensive performance by them the last couple of weeks. But you don't make the playoff with just one side of the ball. And I think that's the way the committee saw it. So unfortunately for Florida State, missed the playoffs. Playoffs are set. It is Michigan versus Bama and Washington versus Texas. Man, <laughs> I'm ready for those games. That uh, should be some good football. Should be some football. Good, good football there, but there we go. That is your final four. FSU five, Georgia six. Florida State and Georgia will play each other. I don't know what that game will look like. Who's going to play for both teams? You know, Georgia was dealing with injuries versus Alabama in the SEC championship game. Who's going to play for Georgia? And who's going to play for Florida State as well? Um, so we'll see uh, how that goes. I know we'll all have eyes on that game. Uh, but Scott brings up a good point. The first comment of the day here in the chat, at least Georgia and Florida State won't win the natty. Hey, that's the, uh, for, from our perspective, uh, about as good as news as you could get for a Florida Florida fan right now. Not even going to a bowl game, but it looked all season where it was likely at one point, Georgia and Florida State were going to be in the college football final four. Our two biggest rivals were going to be in the college football final four. Did we get to the final Saturday? championship Saturday, and it works out where both are left out of the college football playoff. Kind of going to Chase's point here as well. Best case scenario if you're a Florida fan. One little golden nugget in what has been a fairly depressing season. Go Gators as always. Good point. Good point. Jason brings up a good point here as well, and I'm going to go to Dennis's second point. Kind of um, on the, along the same vein. Dennis, you know, does FSU left out hurt them in recruiting? Can't ignore that ACC schedule, strength of schedule, hurt them. An undefeated SEC team would never be left out, right? Uh, undefeated SEC team? No, not, not, not at all. An undefeated ACC team we just saw would be left out. Granted, it took, I think, if Jordan Travis was healthy, it's not even a question. I, I, Florida State's in. Sorry, Alabama. And rightfully so. Definitely rightfully so. Florida State should have been in. Even with not as strong a schedule as Alabama, you don't keep Florida State out if Jordan Travis is healthy. Uh, that, that is the single biggest factor here. So, going back to the point, does FSU left out hurt them in recruiting? Jason, comment right here on the YouTube live. Imagine trying to recruit for ACC teams. Yes, we're undefeated, but you should still come to us. Just imagine if them athletes were on SEC teams called Florida. All right, well... I don't think that holds weight right now, though, because we're going to a 12-team playoff next year. So Florida State scenario wasn't, wouldn't even come up. It, it, just, it just wouldn't. Uh, I'd be interested to see if even the – if the committee knew 12 teams were getting in, would Alabama even be ranked ahead of Florida State? Now, of course, I do think you'd have to shift the rankings right now to make sure you get the four best. But how much does the committee's mindset change just to get 12 teams in? Like right now, I would say it'd probably be very likely Florida State would still be four. So that's a different way of looking at it. If they would be four in a 12-team playoff, why shouldn't they be four in a 14-team playoff? Just thinking out loud, I just think some. I think the mindset might change. But for this in particular, the comments that were brought up here, in the future, I still don't really. I still think you got plenty to sell if you're Florida State because now you're saying look, this this scenario won't happen again. It's a 12-team playoff will be in that. So 
while it does sting, while I think you can somewhat maybe make fun of an ACC team, undefeated ACC team not getting in and trying to use that against them, if the recruits are smart enough, they're going to know, well, if that happens again, it's a 12-team playoff. We're going to be in anyway. Uh, so that's the one. That, that's the way I look at it. Maybe you guys can have another angle on that one, but I don't think it hurts them too much, given that they can um, overcome that for a 12-team playoff. Uh, Vaki says, today was the best case scenario. Yep. If you're a Gator fan, absolutely. I would not have liked to see if a shooting playoff, you know, fan-wise, fan-wise, Gator fan-wise. You know, like I said, in some ways, they they did earn it. But, um, yeah, it's good that we don't have to see them or Georgia in the playoff. Uh, but, but. Let's see. I'm trying to. Going through comments. Insane mob. How do you know if FSU can't win on the field? I don't know if they can't, but I think if you're the committee, you play the chances here. And the way Florida State has played the last couple of weeks, that's not beating Alabama. That's not beating Michigan. That's not beating Washington. Just not. You know, the scenario is a little different than Ohio State a few years ago. You know, they went to their Big Ten championship with a third string quarterback and they beat Wisconsin, what, 52 to nothing? If Florida State would have won 52 to nothing last night, they'd probably be in the playoff. I don't know if anybody knows for sure they're not going to, but I think if you play. I mean, and that's the unfortunately the part of college football here with only four teams. You in some ways have to play hypotheticals in your mind, or that's where the committee is going to view it. If you're then having to choose to pick the four best teams, unfortunately, there's going to be some hypotheticals in play. Uh, G Tringa Taringa, whatever, whatever, whether they admit or not, the TCU beat down last year was a variable in the committee's decision. Uh, maybe, but I mean, TCU won in the first round, uh, they got to the final. A lot many people were picking them against Michigan and they destroyed Michigan. So, if it did play a factor, then I think that's that's kind of wrong. I mean, they, they did prove that they somewhat belong more than people thought they did by beating Michigan. Like I said, you can. I think you can attack it from both sides. I, mean, I don't. I don't blame people, especially Florida State fans. I don't blame you for being. I'd be ticked off as well. I mean, if it, if it was Florida, if, if I put myself in that shoes, I'm making the same arguments you're making. Absolutely, I'd be making those same arguments. I try to look at that sometimes. You know, what, what would I do if I was in those shoes? Yeah, I'd be making the same arguments. Oh, any other Georgia, FSU, who you guys got in that game? Do you, do you think? Think Georgia puts all their pieces out there? I mean, Brock Bowers kind of still fighting through some injury. Do you think he gives it a shot? Lad McConkey dealing with some injuries as well. Lee McDaniel. I, I saw this brought up a little bit. FSU should refuse to play in the Orange Bowl. Well, that just hurts your own team. Um, I think FSU could use the practices. FSU is trying to figure out who their quarterback will be next year. And that's probably Tate, right? But so wouldn't you want him to get the bowl reps? Wouldn't you want him to get the practice reps next uh, month or so? Uh, I'd attack it from that way. Uh, I don't think you uh, do it out of spite here. Uh, I think if, you know, if you're a team, you know, look, FSU may be trying to 
I mean, I think we've already heard they probably will be looking for their next quarterback in a transfer portal or an option, maybe. There's been some reports that they may be offering some of these quarterbacks in a transfer portal, but you know, with some a lot of probably departures from this year's team, I think you'd want to have all those practice reps. Also, go out there and prove somewhat again that you might belong. Go out there and beat Georgia, and then you can kind of shut everybody up in some ways. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, I, I've seen that angle from Florida State fans, and I've seen it from both sides from Florida State fans saying, yes, they should not play in the Orange Bowl, and that they should. So that's that's out there. Wally Gator says, they, uh, Florida would never have the 55th strength of schedule, Dave. No, nah, I, I agree with that part. But at the same time, if Florida, um, last two games of the year, playing with a backup quarterback, did not look great against competition, they just say the same thing wouldn't happen. And saying, uh, okay, this conversation again, Dave, if you don't know, then why not let FSU prove it on the field? Because I think Alabama is better. I think Texas is better. And that's the way the committee's going with it, too. Like I said, I would have had no issue with Florida State got, got named to it. I, I wouldn't have. I can see why they didn't. I can see why they're left out because of the quarterback situation. And look, they could... I mean, though, sorry, they, they, they can't prove us wrong because they don't get the opportunity. And like I said, if you're an FSU fan, that stinks. It absolutely does. Now, what I do hope, uh, what I do hope that that really is the case. Now, I don't, and it, look, it may be mixed by the committee. I really do hope in some ways that if they really thought Bama was the best team, then okay. I can live with that more so than, hey, we need Bama for TV ratings, and hey, we need Bama, um, you know, maybe some SEC bias coming in, co- coming in to that, and I know the FSU side of things is going to bang that drum. You know that's coming, you know, or and from their perspective should come. I mean, this is the reason I'm not, I'm not, look, I wish we still had a two team BCS. <laughs> That's how I am. But you now you see why the, the screaming for an expanded playoff, you don't get this. I think you start giving too many teams chances, which is where I'd say I, I would have cut it off at six always. Look, I didn't want to play off to begin with, but if you were going to have it, I think six teams is better. Just so you make sure you get, where this scenario doesn't really happen. Should have been six to begin with. Four was just dumb. I mean, if you're going to go and not want to leave teams out, six would have been the way to go. But hey, look, all water under bridge now. We're getting, we're getting 12 next year. All right, so there we go. There we go. We'll get into some more. Bowl. I mean, there's some exciting SEC bowl games as well, some exciting bowl matchups at the, uh, out there. But uh... <laughs> definitely no 64 team playoff. <laughs> uh... But yeah, if there's any other bowl games out there that uh, you guys are excited to see, and maybe we can go through them right quick, maybe. Um, any more that kind of. I should have had this pulled up before we got in here, but that kind of catch your eye. You got Liberty and Oregon. Oh, man. Uh, if uh, look, Who knows where Oregon's roster is going to be, if Bo Nix is going to play, all that kind of stuff, but that would be shaping up to be a blowout. Um, yeah, Keely, I saw that. More players leaving Florida. I'll get that in just a second. Andrew Savanea. Um, of course, not really a contributor for Florida. It's going to hit the portal. That was kind of expected. 
Uh, Fiesta Bowl, Liberty, Oregon, Orange Bowl, Georgia, Florida State, Peach Bowl, Ole Miss, and Penn State. That should be a good one. Uh, Cotton Bowl, Missouri, and Ohio State. So there you go. Uh, two more SEC teams in the New Year's Six. Uh, Ole Miss, Penn State. That's a that's an interesting one there. I mean, Ole Miss, their toughest games of the year, Georgia, Bama, you know, the blowouts, losses for them did beat LSU. Uh, Iowa, Tennessee, oh, man, that can, could be a pretty boring game there. Wisconsin, LSU. Man, I was really hoping for Notre Dame and LSU. Brian Kelly versus his old school. I know that one was being talked about a little bit. That one. That one would have been uh, a, a good storyline. Maryland, Auburn. Uh, sounds like Kentucky and the Gator Bowl, as of what I'm looking at now, has it been decided who they play? So um, we'll go. We'll see. Play more out right there. I don't want to spend too much more time on um, non-Gator talk. But there you go. College football playoff. How Florida may have impacted FSU's chances there would not – adding to their strength of schedule and then keeping Tate Rodermaker out against Louisville and maybe he puts a good performance together, they could find their way to the college football playoff. All right. There's plenty more to talk about. We've got some recruiting to talk about. Saturday was a busy, busy day on the recruiting trail for the Florida Gators. Good news, bad news, of course. Um, a commit, decommit. There's plenty to get into. On that side, I mean, coaching searches, transfer portal, portal opens on Monday. So, yeah, I mean, there's uh, all kind of storylines <laughs> to get into. Um, but all good. All good for college football playoff talk. As we uh, kind of turn the page. No bowl game for Florida to talk about, of course. But we'll get into all those other storylines coming up right here soon. But first, hey, if you found a $100 bill on the ground, you wouldn't walk past it, so don't pass up a chance at Easy Cash with my bookie. My bookie has the biggest online selection of odds and contests to fill all your sports betting needs anytime, anywhere. So you can turn that sports knowledge into cash in your wallet, bet on the NFL, college bowl games, or play for a share of big cash prizes in the weekly blackjack tournaments. If you've been waiting for the right time to get in on the action, well, that time is now. Make your winning move today. Sign up at MyBookie, use promo code GATERS, and claim your deposit match, redeemable, up to $1,000. Again, that is promo code GATERS to claim your bonus. Experience the thrill of sports betting right from the comfort of your home. Bet anything, anytime, anywhere at MyBookie. All right, guys, let's get into it. Some recruiting talk. As, hey, we're about three weeks from early signing day. Florida put the final touches on this recruiting class. Visits coming up this week. But before we get to all that news, a busy Saturday commit, decommit. Let's start first with a commit. And, of course, we did get a commitment again from Makai Burrow from the state of Georgia. As you see, the three-star on the 24-7 sports composite. Three-star on the on three industry rankings. About the same for both there. 726 overall in the 24-7 sports composite. 82nd ranked defensive lineman there on the on three industry rankings. He's 743 overall and the 71st ranked defensive lineman. Of course, out of Georgia on the 2024 class. Six foot five, 390 pounds. The plug, you know, Florida would need in the middle here. It looked like a Florida Georgia battle, somewhat, some way. Of course, he had committed to Florida during the summer and then decommitted back in September. And the thought would be he would go to Georgia and that Georgia was opening up a spot for him, but that spot never really came open. Uh, and now, weirdly, oddly enough, Florida fires defensive line coach Sean Spencer, and in the same week, without a defensive line coach being hired, Makai Burrow commits to the Gators. Kai James, defensive line analyst there for the Gators, assistant coach, playing a role here in helping get that commitment back. But interesting, you know, how it all <laughs> played out from the 
decommitment, and now back to committing here for the Gators. So, like I said, six foot three ninety. Can you fit him in in the middle? He posted on social media Saturday when he recommitted to Florida. First and foremost, I would like to thank my family, coaches, and teammates for supporting me through the process. I would like to say thank you to all the coaches that have given me an opportunity and believed in me. Also, I'd like to thank the most high for giving me the ability to play this sport. After talking to my family and loved ones and lots of consideration, I will be committing to the University of Florida. Go Gators. P.S. Gator Nation, I'm back. My bad for leaving. I want y'all to know I'm back for good. So look, he's going to have to maintain a weight here. I mean, 6'5", 390, big plug there in the middle. Of course, he can eat up space there, but he's going to have to get to a, you know, probably certain playing play weight. You know, I know everybody wants to bring up Des Watson for Florida right now on the defensive line and maybe some weight issues here. Um, Burrow's going to need to, you know, and the staff's going to have to find, maintain where they want his playing weight to be. But interior offensive lineman can eat up space, take on double teams. And, of course, your Florida needs those type of bodies in the middle. But those guys got to be able to stay on the field a bit more, have a more, larger impact. But if you look at his high school film, pure havoc on opposing teams in the backfield uh, from the inside, often forcing ball carries and the quarterback to balance outside, let his teammates make the tackle. Of course, not a heavily statistical position right there in the middle of a defense. The Burrow... 43 tackles in both his junior and senior seasons. Uh, his senior season, that consisted of five tackles for a loss, one sack, two hurries, according to Max Preps. His junior season, seven tackles for a loss, four sacks, and three quarterback hurries. They're at Creekside in Georgia, nose tackle spots. Uh, but, of course, you know that, that position, not going to bring you a whole lot of stats. So... It was just an interesting storyline of being from Georgia. Georgia was the first to offer back in 2020 and thought to be the school to beat for a while. Uh, ends up committing to Florida. But Georgia at one time showed a lot of interest, enough interest to get him to decommit from Florida, but just oddly enough, that flip never happened. Um, Georgia showed interest at one point how they were going to recruit, how they were going to develop him. Uh, got Jordan Davis in on the commitment or the recruitment in at one time. You know, another jumbo defensive lineman that Georgia turned into a first-round selection. So, of course, look, and we know Georgia has a lot to sell up there at defensive line. Uh, but you know, at one time, Georgia was looking at him as that zero-technique player and putting him on their defensive line, but it just didn't work out. Uh, so, ends up back at Florida, however you want to view that. Uh, I know some people came at me where, why would you accept his commitment again? He wanted to go to Georgia and they just didn't want him. Well, I mean, like Florida's just got to get players. <laughs> so um, go get some good players uh, here. You thought he was good enough at one point. Water under the bridge now, I guess. Uh, but back in the class there for the Gators uh, along this defensive line. It just kind of continues the storyline of the way defensive line recruiting has went. And that continued on Saturday. Not long after the commitment of Burrow, Gainesville's own Kendall Jackson decommits from Florida. Uh, he said, first, I'd like to thank Coach Napier for the opportunity to play the game I love at the University of Florida. I'd also like to thank Coach Peterson and Coach Armstrong for the opportunity as well. However, after much prayer and many conversations with my family, I've decided it is my best interest to decommit from the University of Florida Thank you. So he's the 405th overall player on 24-7 sports composite rankings, a four-star, 44th ranked defensive lineman, committed to Florida back in June, but of course now joins Jamonte Waller, Wardell Mack, and Nasir Johnson uh, decommitting for the Gators. Um, like I said, in the same day, thankfully Burrow committed back, so you got some defensive numbers uh, back there for, for, for Florida. But interesting how this one played out too. Asking around a couple, a couple of angles from this. So first of all, it was it was mutual, both sides here. Um, there was some talk of Florida may want him to play more on the inside. He wants to play more on the outside. That was something that was brought up. He brought up, I believe, in a separate conversation that I saw that 
maybe Florida's record and what he sees as far as an outlook for Florida, maybe not there. Uh, and also maybe the communication of defensive line coach Sean Spencer not being a part of the uh, coaching staff now as well. I think, you know, the the firings of Spencer and Raymond probably got out a little faster than Billy Napier wanted it to uh, before they could tell players, before they could tell recruits. Uh, maybe that comes into play here a bit from what I can gather. Uh, so mutual decision, it looks like. I think Miami is in play now here. UCF may be in play as well, but Miami looks like to be the school to to watch for here with Kendall Jackson. And I remember, you know, like I said, when he committed to Florida, looking at Gainesville Buholtz last year, uh, a player that flashed. Uh, probably didn't flash as much this year, uh, but and we'll see well, what, what that holds for Florida, who they replace him with. But for Florida, the recruiting class headed into a transfer portal that is opening on Monday. Florida's 2024 class now has 19 commitments. Falls to six in the 24-7 sports composite rankings with it rose up back up to fourth with the Burrow announcement, but fell back just a few hours later with Kendall Jackson decommitting. Now six on the 24-7 sports composite rankings. Florida's class now has two five stars. That is DJ Lagway, of course, and Xavier Filsamy. 11 four stars and six three stars, according to the 24-7 sports composite. One more time as we go into... Transfer portal opening up on Monday. Florida's class high school players consist of, of course, five-star quarterback DJ Lagway, four-star running back Kanan Daniels, wide receivers Jeray Hawkins, Tawaski Abrams, Isaiah Williams, tight end Amir Jackson, offensive lineman Fletcher Westfall, Marcus Mascal, Mike Williams, Norport Yagan. Go to the defensive side, of course, uh, LJ McCray, Amaris Williams. For now, we'll see where that one goes. Uh, Makai Burrow in the class. Darius Hayes at linebacker, Miles Graham at linebacker, Aaron Childs, of course, at linebacker as well, to go along with five-star safety, Xavier Fielsamy, three-star safety, Josiah Davis, and three-star cornerback, Teddy Foster. That's your Gators class headed into the transfer portal opening on Monday. And look, that's going to be a lot of storylines to to follow there for Florida what current players are going to enter the portal. I know we're all following all the rumors around and real. I mean, not even rumors anymore. Trevor Tien and his interest in maybe transferring away from Florida, a decision to be made still there. Maybe, does that come Monday with the transfer portal officially opening? Uh, so keep an eye on that one. What other players could enter the portal? As mentioned earlier, Andrew Savanea from Billy Napier's first class, that transition class, has announced that he's going to enter the portal. If any more have happened as we have went live here, I probably have missed that. If it's in the comments, then people can, can, can update me here uh, in, in the comments. But, of course, probably have to try and find a way to, uh, to, get, to confirm that, uh, of course. But uh, one more there for the Gators. You're going to have to make some room uh, for this recruiting class. You could... Host some grad transfers this past weekend. I know Notre Dame had the FIU wide receiver uh, on campus this week. That's from Jacksonville. His name escapes me right now. Uh, But uh, could that be an option there for Florida in the grad transfer route? Uh, But we'll see. Uh, Who enters for Florida? Of course, I think we know Florida could use some wide receiver help, offensive line help, defensive line help, linebacker as well. There for the Gators, a couple couple positions of need there for the transfer portal. We'll see next weekend. I think the strategy for the transfer portal, and hopefully Florida learned last year, is to get those guys in early. Some of those guys would make that first visit, commit there, not get off that first campus visit. Uh, I think if as many guys as you can get through the transfer portal on campus as their first visit, the further the positivity can go, and maybe landing their commitment. So we'll see. It's going to be fast and furious this week, guys, of who's in the transfer portal that Florida wants, that could be leaving Florida, and who Florida can get in on visits very soon, whether it be this weekend. This coming up weekend is supposed to be, you know, a week from today or next weekend, supposed to be the big visit weekend for Florida for high school guys and transfer portal guys. So we'll see where it lands for Florida. Still got to make some coaching hires. Still have to make some coaching hires and where Florida is on that. Sean Spencer, Corey Raymond, those guys being fired last Monday, 
Florida still with no hires there. You would love for some some something to happen where you have maybe guys on campus or the recruits have a better idea of who is going to be those replacements. Are there any more coaching moves going to be made during this week as well? I mean, this this is setting up to be a very, very fast and furious head turning week in college football for Florida. We'll have it covered right here on Gators Breakdown <laughs> all, all week long, of course. Uh, but one name to to really look out for is defensive backs coach. Uh, it's starting to filter out. We've we've been talking about the name on the Discord since late last week. Uh, that would be Will Harris, defensive backs coach for the Los Angeles Chargers, was the Georgia Southern defensive coordinator last season before he came from Washington, where he coached some very good defensive backs uh, there. So that's a name, a, a new name to throw to throw onto the big board uh, as we as we look forward. And you know, we talked last week in, in, in the Gators Breakdown Plus chat that I posted up for you guys uh, about some targets along the defensive line and the coach there. But one more name to add for defensive backs coach Will Harris right there uh, for the L.A. Chargers. So him being an NFL guy, does that play into a timeline? Do they want to play with that timeline? Do they want to wait for an NFL guy? Is there any way he could get on campus earlier? Could he be announced earlier just so recruits know? Uh, we'll see how all that turns out. Uh, but that is one drawback of going towards NFL coaches and trying to get them in the college you got. You may have to wait for that NFL timeline. And we're talking January, where the, that coach would be missing the ever-important December and put some final touches on a recruiting class ahead of early signing day. Yeah, all right, so yeah, Kev Holt brings up a good point. I mean, Billy moved too slow for a fast and furious pace. I mean, look, it's got to change. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the sense of urgency has been one of my biggest attractors uh, since Napier's gotten here, with, with, and, and mainly a lot of it because of the transfer portal ever since he's gotten here. Not that he hasn't gotten good players, just not enough of them, and maybe has missed a few more good players by uh, – the slow approach. If he's coaching for his job next year, if he needs immediate results next year, one way to fix that is getting some instant impact transfer portal guys that a lot of other people are going to be after. You got to get them on campus pretty quick. If it plays out like it did last year. That's the way the transfer portal played out last year a good bit. A lot of the targets didn't even get to Florida because they had committed elsewhere on earlier visits. All right, there we go. We'll be in multiple episodes this week. I know there's more we can get into, but hey, got to save some stuff. Got to save some stuff this week. Everybody, thanks for hopping on here, talking college football playoff, talking a little bit of recruiting there for Florida. Um, Fast and Furious week coming up right here on Gators Breakdown. Will Miles and I will get back together on Monday night. Working on a special episode this week. Got some things to figure out, work out there. I'll let you guys know on social media. I'll post it on YouTube, on the, on the channel as well. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. Uh, ho hopefully we'll get some confirmation earlier in the week uh, about about uh, another episode this week that I'm trying to set up. So, all right, there we go. That'll do it for this episode of Gators Breakdown. I am your host, David Waters. You can find me on social media at GatorDave underscore SEC. Guys and girls out there, thank you for joining me on this episode of Gators Breakdown.